the uh, British uh, were, of course, very involved in transatlantic trade. Uh, and so they understood the importance of sea power. And one of the first things that the British did in World War I was to establish a naval blockade of Germany to cut Germany off from the rest of the world, uh, essentially to, uh, to weaken the German economy. Uh, the Germans could not break the British naval blockade, but they could go under it with another new weapon of warfare, and that weapon was the submarine, which the internal combustion engine had made uh, a viable instrument of war for the first time. So the German submarines, called Untersee boats, or U-boats for short, could go underneath the British blockade and counter with a blockade of England and Ireland. So if the British were going to use their navy to cut Germany off, from the trade of the world, then the Germans were going to use their submarines to cut England uh, and Ireland off uh, from trade with the rest of the world. The problem with U-boat warfare was that although what it's doing is as old as naval history itself, commerce raiding, attacking the enemy's overseas supply lines, it was doing it in a new way. The world had been using commerce raiding for hundreds and hundreds of years and law and treaty and tradition had built up around commerce raiding. So that in the era of sailing ships, a commerce raider could safely stop a suspected enemy ship on the high seas, would have the time to board it, inspect it, see what it was carrying, examine its papers, and if it was determined that this was an enemy ship carrying the contraband of war, it could either remove the passenger and crew of the enemy ship onto the commerce raider and then sink the enemy ship, or force the enemy ship to sell with it to a friendly port where it would be confiscated and cargo and goods auctioned, but passenger and crew uh, released in safety. By the time of World War I, you have airplanes, you have radio, uh, and therefore any attempt by a U-boat to stop a merchant ship was probably going to elicit a response from enemy warships or enemy aircraft. U-boats were very small, they were not armored, they were very slow. Uh, they would have a difficult time stopping a merchant ship in most instances because merchant ships were faster, but should they surface and spend hours trying to figure out what to do with a captured merchant ship, they would probably be attacked and sunk by an allied surface ship. And therefore, of necessity, U-boats had to strike without warning, using their deck guns or their torpedoes, and that meant that technically speaking, they were violating the laws of war that existed at the time. Uh, and this was a very serious problem uh, for the United States because so much of England's trade was with America and there were Americans going back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean and often they were sailing on British ships and that meant that they were sailing into a war zone. They were sailing on ships that were subject to attack by German U-boats. And the Germans were very upfront about this. They published notices in American coastal newspapers saying if you're getting on a ship that's flying a British or allied flag and you're sailing to England or the continent of Europe, you're sailing into a war zone and the ship you're on is subject to destruction without warning in that war zone. Uh, this was the potential fail point for America's determination to stay out of World War I. Uh, when the war broke out, President Woodrow Wilson declared that the United States was neutral. But having declared the United States was neutral, that we were not going to fight, he also said the United States is going to treat both sides equally. We'll loan money to both sides, we'll sell our, our raw materials and our foodstuffs and our manufactured goods to both sides. But having said that we were going to treat them equally, he did nothing to ensure that that happened. And since it was far easier, uh, for America to trade with England and France, who were traditional trading partners, America's industrial and agricultural capacity, America's financial capacity, tilted very strongly toward the Allied side to the detriment of the Germans. This obviously doesn't make the Germans very happy, but they're careful to leave American ships alone. But what about Americans sailing on British ships? And President Wilson's Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, warned the President that if he did not issue an executive order warning Americans against sailing on Allied ships into the war zone, sooner or later there would be an incident. Americans would be killed or hurt, 
in a U-boat attack, and when that happened, the American people would respond emotionally, and they would demand war against Germany, and the U.S. would get sucked into this European conflict that most Americans believed it had no business being sucked into. Wilson, however, was a moralist. He believed in a very strict sense of right and wrong. It, the law of nations was black and white. What the Germans was doing with their U-boats was wrong, and therefore he was not going to forbid Americans from exercising their right to travel to Europe on whatever ship they wanted. And so Wilson left the door to tragedy open, and that tragedy struck in May of 1915 when a German U-boat sank the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, just a few hours out of its port of Liverpool. Uh, more than 1,200 people died in that sinking, including 128 Americans. Uh, the Lusitania went down very, very quickly. Uh, the bodies of victims washed ashore on the coast of England and Ireland for weeks to come uh, in desperate efforts to identify uh, those bodies. They hung numbers around uh, their chest and photographed them and published them in the newspapers. And so for weeks and months... Uh, people on both sides of the Atlantic uh, stared at the faces of men, women, children, infants, elderly people, uh, and were reminded of the barbarity of unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, the Germans played this very badly uh, from a public relations standpoint. Uh, they hailed the sinking of Lusitania as a great triumph. They struck a special medal for the crew of the U-20, which had sunk the ship, and by the time the Germans realized that that was not playing well in the United States, it was too late. The Germans had become the villains. The American people reacted pretty much as William Jennings Bryan had predicted. They demanded that the United States punish Germany. The problem was is that President Wilson knew that he didn't want to take the United States into this war. And he was probably also aware that he was at least partially responsible for the Lusitania tragedy. So he refused to take the country to war. Uh, he came out and he said, there's such a thing as a nation being so right that it does not need to convince others by the force of arms. And of course, as he saw, the United States was right. We had every right uh, to let our citizens travel on whatever ship to whatever destination they wanted. Uh, the Germans were in the wrong. And the Germans would therefore have to acknowledge that. So he sent a series of diplomatic notes uh, to the Germans uh, demanding ultimately uh, that they uh, no longer attack any passenger liners and that if they did, it would be viewed as a, quote, deliberately unfriendly act. The Germans, by now recognizing the mistake they had made, actually were willing to give Wilson what he wanted, but they could not publicly announce it because can you imagine... The Germans coming out and saying, okay, passenger liners are now forbidden to be attacked by U-boats. Well, you've just told the Allies, if you have a vital cargo that has to cross the Atlantic Ocean, this is the ship to put it on. So the Germans issued secret orders to their submarine captains. No more attacks on passenger liners, uh, but they didn't publicly announce it. And so Wilson has sort of drawn a line in the sand and dared the Germans to cross it. Uh, and, of course, he's hoping that the Germans won't cross it. The difficulty is that not every merchant ship looks like a passenger liner. You know, the Lusitania reminds you of the Titanic, long black sleek hull and magnificent white superstructure and those four big funnels. Uh, and so what do you do when there's something that looks more like an ordinary merchant ship that's also carrying passengers and it's flying the British flag and some of those passengers are Americans and they wind up in the sights of the U-boat? Well, the U-boat captain isn't going to know what his target is, except that it's an enemy ship and he's going to attack. And that's what happened. Uh, the Germans, uh, just a handful of months later, uh, sank another British ship, the Sussex, and Americans were on board and hurt. Uh, and then a few months after that, they attacked a French channel steamer uh, and did significant damage to it. They didn't sink it. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the first ship was the Arabic. This is the Sussex. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the Germans seem to have crossed Wilson's line. And Wilson says, okay, what of it? And at this juncture, the Germans realize that they're right on the precipice of the United States coming into the war. And the Germans can't let that happen. 
So the Germans issue what's called the Sussex Pledge, and basically they abandon submarine warfare against England. They say we will only attack without warning enemy warships. But they tie a string to that. If they're going to abandon their submarine blockade of England, they want the United States to use its leverage to get the British to abandon their naval blockade of Germany. Wilson plays up the first part of the Sussex Pledge and downplays the second part. So he plays up to the American people, look, the Germans have abandoned unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, that's what we wanted them to do. And notice that I got them to do it without taking us into the war. Wilson knows that there's no way the British are going to abandon their naval blockade. It's too important to them. The Royal Navy has always been England's trump card. And so really what Wilson has is a situation where the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. The Germans will wait for a while, but they will not wait indefinitely. And what Wilson's hoping is, in, is that in the time that he has, he can act as a broker between the Allied and the Central Powers to get a peace without victory, as he puts it, to, to try and talk both sides into saying, look, nobody can win, and to continue the fighting is madness, so why don't we just stop? Why don't we just stop? It was very unlikely that Wilson would have ever been able to manage that. Too much blood, too much treasure had already been poured into the war by both sides for their leaders to simply turn to the populace of their countries and say, oh, well, it was a big mistake. Uh, we're not going to gain anything out of this. But it was the only hope that Wilson uh, really had. And he might have been able to accomplish something, I suppose, uh, if he had not been undermined by the course of events.